tonight. While you're standing, let's go before the Lord in prayer. And I, I guess this microphone is going to have to go in the garbage again. I just, they just sent me another one, but it's going up and down. But we'll, is that, Brother Manning, don't touch that <laughs> dial. If you think I'm too loud, just don't touch that dial. Praise the Lord. No, he said it was him. I was trying to be nice and say blame it on the microphone, but it's Brother Manning back. But let's pray tonight. We got some in the hospital. Sister Ruby needs our prayers tonight. Most of you got the text and the Facebook message. But pray that God will touch her and bring her out of that uh, stroke level that she's at right now. She's in a very high risk of maybe having another one. If, if uh, but they got it under control, keeping her blood pressure stuff down right now. But let's pray that she can get out of there and come home and, and get normal. But a lot of her sickness, they said, probably been this uh, neck things out here that are stopped up most of the time. Sister Betty can probably feel for her right now and some of you others have had this same problem but they said this might cure a lot of her problems even a part of a, a beginning of, a, of a Alzheimer's a little bit they said it probably making it cut enough to her brain and all that good stuff but this could fix it all if they can get this done so let's pray that it can go forward and she can get back to what she wants in Jesus name hallelujah anybody else have a spoken need tonight we can pray for anybody brother white I've got a, a person, and I'm just going to say a person, and you, God knows who I'm talking about. But uh, I talked with today, and they told me that that uh, they're not sure if they can get here this Sunday or not. But from then on, they're going to start giving their life to God 100%. And that means a lot to me. Let's pray for that person. God knows who it is, and give them strength to do that in Jesus' name. Sister Betty. All right. In Jesus' name. Brother Art. Brother Montgomery, keep him in your prayers. Yes, Sister Betty. Pray God, give her the miracle. Anybody else? Sister Carrie. Touching in Jesus' name. Yes, sir, young man. You got a prayer request? All right. Pray for his grandpa in Jesus' name. All right. So much to pray about, but God can touch it. And I know if you have unspoken, lift your hand. God knows about that as well. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this time. Lord, we can pray tonight. We pray for each need that's here. God, we pray for Brother Jeff, Lord, and Sister Carrie, Lord, and the need there that's in their family. We pray you touch right now every need. Touch, God, the young man's grandpa tonight. Lord, you see the needs that are here. God, we call on it, Lord, Brother White's need. We pray for his mother, Lord. Touch that need tonight. Lord, your hand can go forth, Lord, and meet all the needs that are spoken here tonight. God, you've heard them, Lord, and we pray tonight for Brother Montgomery, God, the minister of your gospel tonight, God, to be healed and raised up off that bed. We speak against the pneumonia. We speak against God that he can't walk because we know when your hand goes in, God, a miracle can happen, Lord, and we pray tonight that you're going to anoint this service. You're going to use it, God. Touch these ladies uh, that Sister Betty sit with. We pray you'll move in their lives. Touch their hearts. Uh, God, we pray across this room right now that your spirit would anoint it. We pray, God, every need to be touched tonight. Every unspoken, God, that didn't be spoken tonight. You saw it, Lord. We pray you'll reach down and touch them tonight. Let this service, God, be anointed by your glory. Let it be full of your glory tonight. In the name of Jesus, we ask all these needs to be met. And the church said, in Jesus' name. You can be seated. If our ushers would come tonight, let's get our offering tonight that the Lord can use it. I mean, those God can use this offering to bless it and multiply it in a mighty way. In Jesus' name. Can't never outgive God, but it's always good to give what's appropriate to God. Amen. We ask you to let the Lord use you on that tonight. Amen. Brother Haley, ask the Lord to bless this offering if you would.
a Christian to see him one day face to face. Sister Robinson has got a special for us. How many is glad they didn't stay gone all winter long? Right. They come on home. Praise the Lord. So glad to have them. Brother Robinson, won't you stand and testify while your wife's getting ready to sing tonight? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's awesome, brother. Come on, sister. Obey the Holy Ghost tonight. Bless her good.
Hallelujah. I'll tell you what we need to do together right now is just say Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Now, now say it, say it like you are needing something right now. Say Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. How many's ever ever been upset at somebody and you just said Jesus out of the blue? Jesus. You know, like, come on, get a grip, you know. But there, you know, that's just that's just kind of throwing Jesus' name out there. But when you really need something, like a car is almost about to run over you, you know, and you holler, Jesus. It's a more of a sincere to that, and Jesus comes in to our rescue just at the mention of his name. How many loves that name tonight? What an awesome name. Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah. Love the name of Jesus. I'm thankful for the revelation of Jesus Christ tonight, amen. And I'm sure Brother Zomich's not going to say anything about that. He's going to preach for us tonight, amen. I love to hear Brother Zomich bring the word. I like to hear his voice. It's like, uh, I'll tell you later what it's like. Praise God. It's it's got a smooth voice. I guess you can say that. Amen. I want the Lord to use him tonight. We do have children's church can be dismissed. And uh, if you're going to help decorate the uh, fellowship hall and uh, come in and, and come and uh, uh, support this Thursday, Friday, you can go as well. Sister Land's got an announcement. Anybody's welcome to be in that uh, drama for Thursday and Friday. She needs bodies. Praise God. So uh, if you can't find anybody, let me know. We'll pay somebody to help you, sis. Praise God. It's, it's $100 a night, whoever wants to do it now. Anybody want to go? Well, look at people standing. I'm just kidding. Praise. No, it's going to be fun. They're going to have a fun. That's what it's about, getting together and having fun with the youth. And I love a growing church because you always have people who want to get involved and, and do stuff. And that's what a growing church is about. Amen. So tonight we're going to get preached to. How many wants to hear some good word tonight? I love singing. I do. I love to clap my hands and run around the building, shout sometimes. But sometimes you just got to stop and hear what God's got for us tonight. Amen. So let's get behind Brother Zomic. Everybody say, Lord, set him on fire tonight. Praise God. Come on, Brother Zomic. Obey the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Brother Hunt. He's a good pastor. Amen. He loves people. His wife loves people. And that's what it's all about, you know, <laughs> loving people, showing people the way, the truth, and the life. And that, my friend, goes and focuses on, focuses on Jesus. What a name. <clears throat> what a name. We're going to, beloved, we're going to just look at the scriptures. The epistles that are written are written as love letters to the church. They are God's word by anointed men to the churches. And the scripture says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. There's a, the breath of God on it. And it's good. It's going to profit the ones that hear it and apply it. Hearing the word and doing the word. Amen. You're going to be a successful Christian if you do that. Amen. And so it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instructions, and righteousness. So we're going to go to one of the letters, one of my favorites. They're all good, but sometimes you have favorites. And the book of Ephesians is one of my favorites. The letter that... Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus had a successful church. They numbered in the thousands. In the thousands. And Paul, the apostle, writes this letter. We're going to start with chapter 1. That's all we're going to deal with, really, chapter 1 and maybe a few verses in chapter 2. But I need this because I need to reflect on where I came from. You need to reflect on where you came from. Sometimes we just get too cozy and comfortable, and we need to reflect where we came from. David said, you know, I, sometimes I need to look back to where the pit, where I was in, that God took me out of, that miry clay 
pit. And David found comfort in knowing that God took him out of that. God kept him. And eventually God took him home. And that's our goal, isn't it? The kingdom of God. And so Paul writes the church here. and We're going to start with verse 1. You, I'll, I'll read verse maybe 1 through 3, and then you'll be, sit down, put your seatbelts on, and listen. Amen. We're going to just make a little bit different order of the, in, in the service here. I'm not going to scream and holler. I'm going to minister to you as Paul ministers to the church. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Paul, amen, is directing his letter at a certain people. He's not addressing his letter to sinners. He's not addressing his letter to whoever, politicians or whatever. He's addressing them to a certain people, to the saints and to the faithful. To you and I, we get in church and get filled with the Holy Ghost and we're born again. And we think we have arrived. The fact of the matter is, we have just begun our journey. And our journey is going to take some want to, some determination, some diligence. And in doing so, we will become the faithful that Paul's writing about. To the saints, and out of the saints, to the ones that mature, to the faithful. You've got different varieties of Christians. Some are ain'ts, some are saints, some are faithful, some are diligent. And Paul says, grace to you all. He loves people. And he's writing the church. And the church is active. It's on the move in Ephesus. It's growing and abounding. I'm not talking hundreds. I'm talking mega thousands. And so the body of Christ is powerful in that particular city, which once was a pagan city. And so... Like anything else, Paul has a way in how he flavors his language. And when he writes, he writes with a lot of emphasis on words. He just doesn't say certain things about, you know, good, but he'll have a lot of verbiage, adjectives, and he makes it flowery. Because Paul, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, amen, wants to emphasize to us things about the Word of God, things about us and our redemption that we need to get excited about and not forget. Because the road is not going to be easy. In that day, it could cost you your life or imprisonment. And so... He is writing and making sure to express himself about the grace and peace we have in Jesus Christ. There might not be peace in our surroundings, but in our heart, there's peace. There not maybe be a lot of grace in our surroundings, but we have grace in our children of grace. And so he says, listen, You're blessed. And he emphasized that. Blessed and God is blessed. And we must understand that God needs to be reverenced. And not only reverenced, 
but he needs to be obeyed. And so, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Understanding this, that from the Lord Jesus Christ, from is not in the original. Yes, your King James Bible is biased a little bit. It was written when King James was king, and it was written, England, the Church of England, they had bias about Trinity. And the Trinity was important. And so they always tried to separate God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But the word, words here are, if I could just put them, because of the original word chi means and or even. They chose and because they were biased in their theology. But let's read it. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ. To oneness, people, we get it. We understand it. There's no confusion about the Godhead. Jesus Christ is not a part of a Godhead because Paul wrote the church in uh, Colossians that all the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Christ. Everything you need to know about our God is in Jesus Christ. He is the express image of of the invisible one. Well, he's writing this and he says, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Where? In heavenly places in Christ. And Paul emphasizes in Christ. Jesus emphasized When you abide in me and I in you, you're going to bear fruit. And so in Christ is something that Paul says often because that's where we need to be. That's where we need to abide, in Christ. And so when we're in Christ, we're in heavenly places. We are in the dominion of God and angels. That's where we are. And we have fellowship with God. And angels come to minister to our needs too. They're there to protect us from unseen things, unknown things, people, and devils. God is over it all. He sees it all. His eyes are upon the righteous. And so, Paul just has a way, just wants to emphasize some things right in the very beginning of this letter, this love letter to the church. And he emphasizes that we need to understand we're in the kingdom of God. We are in the kingdom of God. Jesus said the kingdom of God is where? In you. If you have the spirit of the living God, the Holy Ghost, you have God residing in you right here, within you. If you don't understand that, Paul says you better understand that because you can get in a mindset that if you think the kingdom of God is just somewhere distant and God is distant, you don't get what the scripture explains and, and ministers you to. God is with you of a truth. He's not going to leave you. And you've got to understand that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in the kingdom of God are yours in Christ. All spiritual blessings. It didn't say money. It didn't say houses. It didn't say governments. It says all spiritual blessings are yours in Christ. And so 
we have to get a hold of that because we know that the love of money is the root of all evil. Not that money is, but the love of it. And so where your heart is, you know, that's where your treasure is going to be. And so Paul emphasizes some things. He says this, according as he have chosen us, we haven't chosen him. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. God foreknew his foreknowledge. He knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And so he knows when he puts out the statement, whosoever, let him come. He knows who will come. And the foreknowledge of God is a wonderful thing because he chooses us. He doesn't reject us if you come to him. And he knew it before the foundation of the world. God knew Adam would sell out and fall, but he still made him. And he's going to have a people that serve him. And so let's go on a little further. And it says here that we should be holy. We sing about that prior to service. And without blame before him in love. We're to be holy. Why? Because God is holy. And to be without blame. Without blemish is actually a better word. Because if we're in Christ, condemnation doesn't rule us. Guilt doesn't rule us. Our shortcomings, yeah, they're there, but we overcome them, how? In Christ. And so, with this understanding, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It was God's good pleasure to save us. It was God's good pleasure to adopt us, to make us his. We weren't his before. We were the devils. Adam sold out, and the children of the devil were even sitting where? In Moses' seat. Jesus called them out, rebuked them, and said that they do what their father does. Their father was a liar from the beginning. He called them on that. He called them on a lot of things. But to us, it's altogether different in Christ. God looks at us so differently. If you come to him, you give your heart to him, you obey the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you get to the place where you are a saint and become faithful, then all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are yours. Listen, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he have made us accepted. I get a little worried when I hear people, well, I accept Jesus Christ. But does he accept you? He's not going to accept you to, if you're going to stay a sinner. If you won't go on continually going in your sin, whatever it is, and don't repent of it, then, you know, there's a place where this line is kind of like drawn in the sand with him. But if you serve God because you love him for who he is and you are accepted, the Bible says, in the beloved, and that's why John is so explicit when he speaks to the saints, he calls them, Beloved, you are beloved. If you serve the living God, you give your life to him, and you're faithful to him, the scripture tells you that you're going to be blessed. You're of the beloved. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood. We've talked a lot about blood. We sang a lot about blood. And the Bible says, not only that, that in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. His grace is rich towards us. His forgiveness is tremendous towards us. Why? Because we need it. We are not perfect, but we're called for a purpose. We are called, the Bible says, to be saved, to become saved, to be born again. That's how we're called, to come close to him, to enjoy what God wants to give us in redemption. And the Bible says this, that there's a, a point where we're elected, a part of the election. And that election is a call and a step up. And where we're elected to is into sanctification. And that's a process. That's a growth. That's coming from a newborn into maturity. And that's where God wants you to come from a newborn into becoming mature in him, to have the mind of Christ. And Paul talks about that in, in other places. But here, this ministered to me, and I was searching the scriptures because the letter written to the Ephesians is powerful. And as we read on, we're going to understand how Paul talks about some things under the anointing of God so we can get a hold of these things and don't let them go because there's a call on our life and there's an election. There's a process and we're to come to a place of sanctification and holiness. And when we get into that, that's the will of God. That's the will of God. And so the word of the Lord says this, wherein he have, he have abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Is the will of God a mystery? Not to us. Jesus said this to his disciples, because his disciples said, why do you teach in parables? Why? Jesus simply said this, it's not for them to know. But it's for you to know the secrets or the mysteries of the kingdom. And so we get to understand what's going on in the scriptures because we've got the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost brings enlightenment to us. To the churches that are out there that claim to be Christian and don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they are just religious. They don't step into spiritual things. They don't step into spirituality. And because they don't do that, they don't fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that's why he said, not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord, is going to be saved. Because there are those that are going to be going about doing things in his name. But Jesus says, I'm, I never knew you. Of course, he knew who they were, but he never knew them where he called them to be in him because they didn't come to him in truth. And so the Bible goes on to say this. Let's look at it. We are going to start with verse 9. Having made known unto us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he have purposed in himself. We have a purpose. And the purpose of God is explained. It's not a mystery. And we have a purpose in the body of Christ. We are not all elbows, hands, and arms, and legs. We all have a specific calling, and we need to know what our purpose is. And we are to work together for the purposes of God. And so the Bible says this, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Dispensation. God deals with ages. That's what God deals with. We are in the age that is the age of grace in the church. God dealt in the Old Testament. That was dealing with another type of church and people. Old Testament, New Testament. But before even Adam came on the scene, there was an age prior to. That age was judged and that age ended and Adam was born and the human race came into being well this age has got a time limit and this age is going to come to a close but the church age is now and the church age is where we get involved in the things and the purposes of God. Coming to church, worshiping is a part of that. But it's more than that. It's a life to live. It's being faithful to the Lord. It's listening and getting direction from the Lord and following that direction and fulfilling the will of God. Jesus as a man fulfilled the will of God as a man. In doing so, God became the mediator. He didn't send another mediator, another angel. He became our salvation. That's what the Bible says. And knowing that, we understand that God is judge. And we're all going to stand before the judgment of God. But those that are in Christ are going to be spared. We're going to be judged according to our works as far as rewards for what we do in the church age. But we're not going to be saved by our works. And we're not going to, just because we're a good, do good things, we're going to be rewarded. But we can't possibly be saved by our good works. We are saved by the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so Paul's way of of communicating under the anointing of the Holy Ghost brings these things so we understand the truth. And the truth is God loves us. The truth is God has called us. The truth is God has called us to a place in him and we are to grow in his the knowledge and the grace of Jesus Christ here we go in whom also we have obtained an inheritance all right being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will So there, my friend, is that we are called and we have a purpose and God's going to work it out according to the counsel of his own will and we are predestined. I think it was Calvin that talked, I don't know if it was Calvin, but there was a Christian leader in a group of followings that said about predestination. That no matter what you do, God has already predestined certain people to be saved. And if you're not in that group, no matter what you do, you cannot be saved. That's false doctrine. But that was a heresy that was spread. The thing about it is, because God foreknows everything, the fact is, because you chose to follow his lead and obeyed his voice, you have been elected or chosen. And that's a wonderful thing. And Paul wants us to know that. He wants us to know 
The fact of the matter is you didn't choose God just because you decided to choose God. You need to wake up and understand, if you don't understand this, that you were lost in your sin. You were in darkness, not knowing real spiritual truths because they were a mystery to you. But because you answered God's call and because you followed God's lead, now you're beloved. You have been born again and you have been on the path of righteousness and you're going from being uh, just a child of God adopted into the place of being elected unto sanctification and you are becoming mature in Christ in other words you're coming to a place where the devils tremble because of what you know about God and what you have in Christ and the power that's in the name of Jesus sinners can use the name of Jesus to rebuke devils and because the name is so high and powerful devils have to obey the name of the Lord but the devils made it very plain Jesus I know Paul I know but who are you and if you don't know who you are in Christ, there's a problem. You need to know who you are in Christ. And if you know who you are in Christ, you become a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Because you can be bold. You can stand. And you can go on the offensive. And that's what God wants. Paul put it this way in another place about being a good soldier in Christ. You need to endure hardness. And so there's a fight to fight. And Paul finally said, I fought the good fight of faith. I finished my course. God gave him a course. God gave him a purpose. And Paul, the apostle, finished it. He finished it in martyrdom, but he finished it. And I'll tell you what, for him to live was Christ, in his own words. And to die was what? Gain. Gain. And so Paul says it from experience in his knowledge of God and his knowledge of the scriptures. Paul understood the Old Testament. He was a student of it. And Paul wrote most of the letters to the church. And so we got to understand Paul's understanding and his depth of understanding. Peter said it was deep, deep, deeper than what Peter knew. Paul knew because Paul was a student of Scripture. And so that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom we also trust after that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye became, believed. And what happened? Ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost of promise. Peter said, hey, repent, because they asked him, what should we do? Repent. Be baptized, every one of you. Where? In, how? In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sin. And you shall receive the promise of the Holy Ghost. It's a promise of God. And this promise, this Holy Spirit, this Spirit of the living God, the one true God, Paul goes on to say, which is the earnest of our inheritance and Till the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What's he saying? You are sealed once you have the Holy Ghost for a purpose. You have received the mark of God as 
ownership over you. You willingly have him as your king, your God, to serve. Stewardship. Being able to manage the things of God. Understand the things of God. Walk in light of the things of God. Listen to what the scripture says. And by the way, you're his possession. You're not your own. You belong to the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the great shepherd, the shepherd of your souls. All right. And he goes on to say this. Cease not to give thanks. And he did not cease to give thanks for the church, but especially the Ephesians. Cease not to give thanks. Oh, wait a minute. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Listen to what he says here. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, what? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of spiritual things. No, the knowledge of him. Because God said in Jeremiah, if you're going to glory, glory in that you understand and know me. That's your glory. That's man's glory. Not riches, not so-called wisdom, not your career, not power or might, but knowing him and understanding him, understanding who he is. His identity is so important. And so that was Paul's prayer. Revelation was the big theme with, with Paul, getting you to understand who the chief cornerstone was, the foundation being right in your life. Because Jesus said, if you're going to build on the sand earthly things, earthly wisdom, earthly religious doctrines and commandments of men, your house is going to fall one day. But if your house is built on that foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and that was Paul's theme in ministry, being a wise master builder, he wrote. He knew the importance of knowing your God and understanding your God. And he said, man, I'm going to pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him what, what's it gonna do? What, what else does he say? That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That you won't be in darkness no more. That you won't be in confusion no more. That you will see Jesus exactly the way he should be seen. As almighty God come in the flesh. Amen. He is not only going to be the judge... But he's going to be your advocate. He's going to be your defense lawyer. And so, and he provided salvation by his own blood. That the eyes of your understanding and, and uh, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the, and he goes on and on and on. And what is the exceedingly greatness, and there's his way of just adding flowery wordage. And what is the exceeding greatness, not just greatness, of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his power? No, his mighty power, which he wrought where? In Christ. When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Understanding this, the right hand of God is the power of God. It's not just, you know, there's not a throne besides a throne. When the Bible talks about the right hand of God, it talks about the power of God. Can you say amen? 
Jesus Christ is the power of God. Amen. Because the holiness of God was one thing. And the sinfulness of man was another thing. And there was a gulf between it. But the right hand of God is not short that it cannot save. And God, he's the one that brought the bridge. The cross between heaven and earth. The access is the cross. Jesus Christ being the one Lamb of God that made it possible, that made it possible for you and I to be saved and have a relationship with God. So, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality, rule, and power, authority, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. The name of Jesus Christ is supreme. No higher name. No greater God. No greater revelation. I'm sorry to the Muslims. They think they have the last revelation of God. And they kill for it. But I tell you, Jesus Christ is the last message to man to get right and to do right and how to be right with God. And God does it because it pleases him that individuals be saved. It is not God's will that any should perish. And so he goes on to say this. He says, and have put all things under his feet. Whose feet? And are you not a part of the body of Christ? You have authority in Jesus' name. You are somebody. You're not a nobody in Jesus' name. But don't think, and we will go a little further, don't think you are high above and more powerful than human being can be because flesh is flesh. As long as you're here, you've got to battle the flesh. And as long as you're here, you've got to war against the flesh. And you've got a big plus because the spirit wars against the flesh. And the flesh wars against the spirit. But who's going to prevail? Well, that's up to you. That's up to me. If you're stay. In him, you're going to prevail. You're going to be an overcomer. And that's what Paul is writing to the church. He's saying this, that all things are going to be under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things in the church. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. There only can be one head. This is the church of Jesus Christ, or another place is written that this is the church of God, one and the same. Jesus Christ is God. And so, which is the, and then it goes on to say, <clears throat> which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, that's pretty powerful. I, I can't get a quite an understanding about what that and all that entails but if you're in the body we can well god has a plan god has a purpose for the body of christ now he goes into saying this in chapter two and this is what we need to realize yes we have all these promises yes we have all these things we have the earnest of our inheritance for redemption we are to purchase uh We are purchased by his blood. We belong to God. And the earnest of our inheritance is the Holy Ghost. In other words, God is basically saying, I'm giving you, and I'm going to say this in an earthly way, you're going to be married to me. You are my body. You are my bride. And I'm going to give you an engagement ring. That's my spirit. 
And as long as we are in a marriage, as long as we are together, it's going to be a good thing. You've got, I got and have given you my spirit. And it's just a down payment, if you will, an engagement until what the real thing is going to happen when you finish your course. When that sanctification takes a part in your life and you get to that place of blamelessness, well, all that can happen. And it's not to say that you're going to be perfect. It's just say you're on the road of perfection, the road to maturity. It's a straight and narrow way, but it's an easy way and the gate's going to be, the entrance is going to be wide for you if you pay attention to the instructions of the Word of God. And so the Word tells us here, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And you have he quickened or made alive, okay, who were what? Dead in your trespasses and sins. That's something you need to realize. Hey, that's what I was. That's not what I am now. But I must understand, that's what I was. So when I deal with people that are in that kind of condition, consider yourself when you were in that kind of condition. So when it comes to saving and come to ministering, you don't get critical. And so you reach out with love. Wherein in times past, the Bible says, you, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Hmm. I'm going to end right there. Because we're going places, church. We have been purchased. We have been bought. And the saints have... That word saints is mentioned 40 times by Paul, just by Paul alone. 62 times it's been written in the New Testament. It's holy ones, the ones that are set apart for God's purposes. Because God has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for me. And by manifesting himself as the Lamb of God for the atonement and redemption of your souls to escape the righteous judgment of God because God's going to judge. And heavenly places is where we need to be. We need to have the mindset that we're not just children of the flesh, but we have been purchased, ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we've been picked out and we have been Chosen to have a consecrated walk with God. Mm. In character and in conduct. Sanctification, amen, is a call to the saints. And we need to understand that. In the book of Revelation, and I'll end with this, 7.15, it says there's going to be a certain people that are gathered by the throne. The elect. The elect. Why don't we just take a time right here and realize in our heart of hearts that we've been bought with a price. And it's not by silver or gold. God purchased us, amen, with a purpose in mind that we would serve him. And serve him we must. That's the call. And we got to come to the Lord and the realization that God is holy. And we got to serve him in holiness and sanctification. So why don't we just come to the altar tonight and talk to the Lord a little bit. I'm sure he wants to talk to us. I felt in the Holy Ghost before I, I, I came tonight that God has said, you know, ask when you come to him he told me to ask because he's there to hear after all he's our heavenly father he doesn't have a deaf ear though sometimes we wonder 
Where are you, God, in this situation I'm in? Well, the situation you're in is going to cause you two things to happen. One is going to make you go towards him or be offended and walk back from him. Step towards him tonight. Why don't you come? Make your peace with him. Make your request known to him. Personal request. Not just in a church setting among church people, but person to person, soul to soul. And see what God will do. It might not happen instantly, but God hears, and you want it done according to his will, his purpose. In Jesus' name, I'm going to pray because I need to pray. In Jesus' name.